In a world devoid of color, one rainbow-clad, gun-toting unicorn badass is the only hero brave enough to stand up and fight. Run, jump, shoot, swing, Molotov cocktail and shish kebab your enemies until you've taken back the world's color and restored it to its former glory in this one-bit unicorn adventure fit only for the most hardened unicorn rainbow loving sons of bitches hey oh welcome everyone to today in the scene this is episode 53 and i'm joe with indie arcade wave um i just wanted to say thank you to everyone that's been checking out the show liking sharing subscribing things like that it means a lot to us it helps us grow and this week we're going to be talking to Rafa. He's the creator of Unichrome, um, the game, and it's and a whole bunch of other indies he's made for iOS and Android. And this guy seems like he's working on a million projects at a time. As I look at his Instagram, it seems like he's always got something new going on. Um, so I just wanted to let everybody know about Super 8-Bit Rafa and talk about Unichrome today. So this is kind of a, a unicorn retro feeling game. Think like Super Mario meets Enter the Gungeon is kind of the way that the game plays out. Um, so I guess further ado, let's just uh, bring in Rafa. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. I can't complain. Um, I, I guess I could, but who would listen, right? Not you. That's not Right. Um, There's no need to complain, right? <laughs> you get to work on video games. So um, I guess we'll just start there. I'm, I mean, before we jump into it, I just want to say thank you to everyone that's been listening. Um, if you haven't already subscribed, hit that subscribe button, hit the bell so you get notifications, whether you're on YouTube or podcast, and we'll just keep rolling. New episodes every Friday. So first off, tell us about yourself, Rafa. Let us know kind of who you are, how you got into it, and where you started with the game. Yeah. Um, so uh, for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm, uh, like I said, uh, Super 8-Bit Rafa. Uh, Rafael Estrada, my real name. Um, and I started off as an, as a visual artist. I've been a painter like my whole life. Um, and I've done a whole bunch of different work, uh, that has to do with visual arts. So I've done graphic design. I, um, uh, even recently I had a little caricature stand. I started doing caricatures out in like, uh, um, like touristy spots kind of was like, got me some experience on like having my own business. Um, so, uh, I've done some mural work uh oil paintings acrylics digital um i know all of that stuff that's been my life pretty much um um and so i most i recently got into uh video games i love video games i've always had a passion for video games uh the type of interactive storytelling for me has always been very exciting um and kind of i guess the reason that i switched over from visual arts to like, um, we'll, we'll just call them video games, I guess, um, is because um, whenever you pick up a paintbrush or whenever you start drawing or whenever you start to do anything in the visual medium kind of space, um, you're automatically competing with every artist that's come before you, right? Right down to that first caveman that painted on walls um so anything you do in that space is not really gonna be new right it's 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 all already been done right um uh, your voice uh your style uh your point of view that's always going to be unique and that's going to be individual to you um but uh for the most part everything in the visual arts has already been done so um i see video games or interactive fiction or interactive narratives, um, whatever you want to call them, um, as this emerging art form. It's only been around for a few decades. It's something brand new. Um, and to me, that's very exciting to have the opportunity to do something that hasn't been done, to try and pioneer an art form and, and just be part of this community, right? It's like uh, um, this whole scene of an emerging and the maturing art form um to me it's just it's just uh too exciting not to be a part of um pretty much um i don't know if that that was i don't what was the question again 
just about who you are. I mean, I think that answers it perfectly. And it, it even kind of segues into what I wanted to ask next. And you kind of sort of answered at the same time is when did you know that you wanted to go into game development? I mean, you mentioned the fact that like when you're working with a pen and paper or paintbrush, whatever, everything's already been done, but you have so much freedom where you're, you're taking, I guess, to oversimplify it, anything that is drawn, painted or whatever is kind of one dimensional. Obviously there's emotion there. There's, there's a lot of things you're portraying in the photo, but everyone's interpretation is going to be so different off of a still image. Now, when you have a game, you really have the freedom to tell that story and you can put so much more depth into it. What, what was it about video games that like, you were like, I have to start developing? No, I mean, well, that's exactly it. I mean, you, you started to say it there, right? It, it, not to say that other art forms are one dimensional, dimensional, right? It, not to say, not to take anything away from, uh, you know, performing artists or musicians. Um, but video games are really this type of art form, um, and there's others like it, that uh, incorporates all of these art forms together. It's kind of like the Avengers coming together uh, in one team, right? So you, you can have performing arts, you can have music, right? That, those are big parts of video games, and you also have visual art, and you have um, programming, right? Um, so you have all of these things put together. Um, I've always had a love for video games. Um, a, a big part of my life growing up were video games. Um, I grew up in my house, we had a, an Atari 2600. Um, um, it, it's definitely before my time. Um, and we had like a like an old school like black and white TV that we would plug up the Atari to. Um, again, this was just like old stuff that was. I don't know why we even had it. I had older brothers and 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 they were into interested in games. Um, and I just remember uh, Joust. I don't know if you know this game Joust, um, which was you you were like this little pixelated character on on ostrich. Uh, and you were a jouster, right? Those guys with like the big, long, they're not swords, they're like sticks. I don't know, they're like a combination between a sword and a stick. And um, it was so slippery. It was like a platformer, but you would like slide so much. It was like, uh, it was very hard to control. And I just remember having this feeling of like, a, like almost like addiction. I was like hooked. Um, where the song was getting stuck in my head and I would actually dream about it. I'd go, I'd go to sleep and the song would, would seep into my dreams and stuff. So I've always had a huge passion for video games. Video games, as soon as I um, saw my very first video game, I, they grabbed hold of me um, and they never let go. Um, and of course I grew up with like uh, the Sega Genesis after that and then uh, PlayStation. Um, all that classic stuff um, for me has always been a part of me. The one thing that wasn't a part of me, the one thing that I didn't know about was that, uh, and I guess I should have figured, uh, people make these. You could actually make these yourself. And I think for the longest time, I just didn't realize that that was a viable uh, a job or that was a viable choice, right? Um, I was a visual artist and that's very self-explanatory. You pick up a pencil, you start drawing, and you just get better. And you could, you could, uh, you know, tell stories uh, through those drawings. Um, but video games, I really didn't even have an idea of how they were made. Um, and I think that's a big problem right now um, for people trying to get into it as well. Uh, there's this mysticism. There's like this barrier of mysticism, this barrier to entry, where people just don't really understand how you really go about making a game and um, and, the, and that's definitely true for me for probably most of, most of my life. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what we're trying to do here at Indie Arcade Wave is remove that mysticism, like let people know that it's not going to say that it's easy to make games, but it's very accessible. And there's, there's many pro programs that you could use. And we have all these people that have been on here that have give their, given their advice that you kind of skip the pitfalls of first getting into it. Um, and right. I mean, I think you said it perfectly, like games like that, like Joust, which then inspired Killer Queen, which is one of the biggest indie arcade games there are out. And I've had plenty of games where I get the music stuck in my head or I dream about the game when I've been playing it too much. And yeah, I, I heard it, about it this. Sits, it does. 
I heard this story about this guy who was, uh, he was like into extreme sports. Um, not me, I don't, I'm not into extreme sports or anything like that. Um, and it was an article I was reading and he, he talked about uh, canoeing and uh, he was, he was really into like um, rafting. It was like more like rafting and um, that he got so into it that he would dream about it and he would wake up uh, doing kind of that rowing motion. Uh, he'd, he'd wake up from his dreams doing those rowing motions. And after a while, um, that went away. And so he kept chasing those feelings. He kept trying to find the next thing that would make him have like these kind of like, like very vivid dreams. So he went to rock climbing and sure enough, he had that same feeling of like uh, in his dreams climbing up. Um, so when I heard that, I, I, I think uh, I, I related to that a little bit. Um, Tetris, Joust, um, those are all games that have, that have kind of stuck with me. Yeah, I mean, committing it to the subconscious and the subconscious takes over and causes the dream. And, you know, it's, it's what you enjoy doing when you're awake. So why not do it while you're dreaming, right? Um, I guess my next question for you, Rafa, is where did the idea for Unichrome come from? Like where where did you where did you come up with the idea of a unicorn shooting a gun at all these different bosses? Like it's such an interesting idea. I just I need to know where you where you thought of this. You know that's that's something that I'm kind of trying to figure out too. I, it's I I wish I could tell you like there was this aha moment of like oh yeah unicorn plus shotgun equals awesome game. Um, you know that's how it happens in the movies, and I think it, this is kind of like a question that. Uh, as a visual artist, I would get a lot is like, where do you get your inspiration from, right? And I, I think the the dirty little secret is uh, for all artists is that inspiration doesn't just come, right? Uh, the secret to uh, being a successful artist, I think, is to continuously do work, right? Because if you're waiting for inspiration, if you're waiting for that moment, that epiphany moment, that aha moment, um, when it finally comes, you will not have enough work behind you uh, under your belt uh, to do that inspiration justice. So my philosophy is just to continue to keep working. Um, uh, I wish I could come. I, I wish I could take credit for um, the idea of uh, Unichrome, but the truth is, I didn't really come up with it. It just kind of happened. Um, so uh, to kind of uh, tell you the whole story, I guess, to kind of explain further. Um, I had just met uh, my my girlfriend that I'm with now. We were barely dating, and uh, we went out to the beach uh, to meet some of her friends. Um, and she, at this point, she doesn't know that I'm into making video games. She doesn't know that this is kind of my, my hobby. She thinks I'm a painter. Um, <laughs> and uh, we're talking, we're talking about, I think, one of the Star Wars movies had just come out and um, New Year's was coming up and we were talking about, okay, what are you, what, does anybody have New Year's resolutions? And I just blurted out without thinking, um, yeah, I'm going to make 50 games next year. And I remember them both kind of looking at me and going like, huh? Like, what? like my girlfriend didn't even know that I like to make games. And I don't know why I said that, but I just, gave myself this weird goal of, I'm gonna make 50 games next year. Um, this was uh, 2018 or 2019, and um, and that was a crazy year for me. Uh, I made about a game every week. Uh, there was moments where I fell behind, um, so I had to catch up and make more than one game a week. Um, and during this whole process of making a game, uh, more or less every week, uh, one of those games, about the fourth or fifth game was uh, Unicron. Um, uh, so I was just throwing out just random ideas. Um, I was, when you're, when you're making a game in such a short amount of time, you're not really thinking about what you're making. You're just, you're just creating and you're just trying to get things done and um, you're making it up as you go along. Um, so what I did for a lot of those games is I joined something called a game jam. I don't know if you're, I don't know if you're familiar with game jams. Um, 
Yep, we have lots of people come on here and talk about game jams. Yeah, yeah. So for for anybody who doesn't know, um, a game jam is basically a video game making marathon where you people try to make a game in a short period of time, usually forty eight hours, uh, seventy two hours, uh, something like that. Um, a very small amount of time. And um, all around a singular random theme. Um, so for one of these game jams, uh, weekly game jam. If you don't know about it, weekly game jam is great. They do it every week. You get a week to do make a game, and they have a random theme. Um, so I made the the theme was uh, rainbow unicorns, and uh, obviously I hated the theme. I don't. I don't. Uh, <laughs> hate is probably <laughs> a strong word, but. Um, I'm, I'm not a guy who's into rainbow unicorns. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just not. It's not something that I'm, you know, I, I don't have like rainbow unicorn stickers or anything like that. Um, so I was like, how do I twist this into something that I like? Um, at that point, I still hadn't done a platformer and I've always wanted to make a platformer. It's probably my favorite genre. Um, so I started there. I'll, It'll be a rainbow unicorn and it'll be a platformer. Um, and then uh, I, I, to make it fun, I, 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 gave, I gave her a shotgun um, because the, I mean, I, I, was, I was trying to appeal to myself. Um, I did not like the game once it was done. I wasn't even gonna put on the game jam. Um, but uh, my girlfriend, she, she, she thought it was good. Um, at that point, she was playing everything that I was making. Um, she's not a video game fan, uh, but uh, she was she was playing. Every, I was I was forcing her to play everything that I made, and um, she thought it was good. She was like, "This is some of the best stuff that you've done." So um, she convinced me to put it out out there, um, and to my surprise, other people liked it. It was uh, one of the few games that I made that year that actually. People liked playing. People immediately were downloading it a lot more than any of the other games, and people were making YouTube videos on it, um, and some really funny ones. Um, and so that kind of inspired me to keep going. Um, um, and now it's three years later. <laughs> I'm still not done. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it it wasn't it wasn't any inspiration. It wasn't like it wasn't like I picked that. Um, I came up with it. Um, it just kind of happened. Yeah, just organic. I mean, you you had that game jam, and you didn't really like the theme, and you were like, "Let's roll with it. Let's see what happens." Um, yeah. that, I mean, that segues and perfectly into my next question, which was, "What made you kind of lean towards the YouTube test side?" I mean, I don't I don't know if this was intentional for you to have YouTubers try it, or if you put the game out and then a bunch of YouTubers made videos. Uh, but usually for people that make a game that early in the stage, they, they don't really want to put it out because it's not finished, right? And you don't feel like unless it's polished, it shouldn't go out. But I think you going that route was brilliant because you got testers while you were super, super alpha. Like you had plenty of time to fix everything that needed to be fixed. So just tell us about that process of having YouTubers play it and how much that kind of uh, directed your development. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it wasn't intentional and I... I Every time you put a game out there, like at least for me, I'm like kind of imagining that people are gonna love it and it's gonna blow up and I'm gonna, you know, and that it's gonna be this amazing game, you know. Um, I'm just kind of like that with everything that I do, right? Um, if I'm washing dishes, I'm I'm like in my head, I'm going, I'm like in the dishwashing championship of the world. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna leave these so clean, right? And it's the same thing with when I'm making video games. I'm like, oh, this game's gonna be so awesome. I'm in the video game champ making championship of the world um everyone's gonna play it everyone's gonna love it but you don't really expect it, uh anyone to really play it i mean i put so many games out there I, I kind of know that a lot of them just they just don't nothing happens from them. but um i was trying out this new website um it's not new i guess but it's a indie game website game tool and um i was putting on my games out there uh for the first time on there and Somehow um, it got onto the like uh, hot new games page on on Game Jewel, and it was on on that for for a few weeks, and so a lot of YouTubers, a lot of indie um, 
uh, people who play indie games on YouTube, they'll just go to that page and they'll just download whatever looks interesting to them. Uh, and that's that's kind of what happened. Um, not everyone liked the game, uh, unfortunately. Uh, watching somebody play your game is one of the most nerve-wracking things um, probably like that I've ever experienced. Um, it's really hard for me to watch somebody play my game. I'll, I get, I, be, uh, I become really, really nervous. My hands will start shaking. Um, it's just like a very nerve-wracking experience. Um, but to see somebody criticize your game, that's something that I can't even stand. Like I can't, I really can't. I'm not, I'm, I, I like critique. I want people to be honest. Um, but some YouTubers, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to get hits, you know, they're trying to put forward their personality. So they want to be really critical and they want to be funny um, at your expense. Um, so that's kind of where I saw that the game had a little bit of potential because um, people, some people started playing the game and they would criticize it before the game even started, right at the title screen. They would be talking smack. They were just like, but they would play through the whole game. It was like maybe like 30 minutes long at that point, um, 15, 30 minutes long. And they were hooked. Like they, they were trying to criticize it, but they kept playing. Um, and that's one of the things that I saw um, that I had kind of nailed was uh, the, the level design. Um, I, in a game jam, you only have um, a small amount of time. So you don't, you can't really create all these crazy game mechanics um, uh, or enemy types. And I had, I think, two enemies in the whole game. And I, I made like five or six levels, uh, but that was enough to, to get me like 20 minutes of gameplay um, and see that people were just like um, really playing through the whole thing. Um, so, um, yeah, I, it, uh, you can't really have um, video games are one of these things where you really do need somebody else to to play it. You really do need to see it through somebody else's eyes uh, because once you get it in the hands of a of a player of somebody somebody else, uh, they're going to play the game completely different than you do. Um, as a designer, you're not going to see the flaws in it. Um, if there's glitches and you're playing the game enough. You're going to like, like know how to avoid those glitches, and you're gonna know how to avoid those the bad bits of design. Um, and so after a while, you can't really tell uh, if you're going the right direction or not. So you you definitely need playtesters at some point. Um, having playtesters early on, um, yeah, it was it was a, it was great. It was great. Um, Yeah, I mean, I, I can't even, like with the Galactic Battleground, I don't think we had anybody play it except for like ourselves and our families for, I had to be six, eight months. Um, so, I mean, having somebody that early on playing it and enjoying it and like you said, even critiquing it or being kind of overcritical, but they kept playing. So right. they may be talking smack, but they do still enjoy it and you see the positives of it and how, how do you reinforce those positives is basically the next step. Um, I guess my question from there is Xbox. So you're looking, if I'm not wrong, from what I've seen from your Instagram, you're looking to go pretty much exclusively Xbox um, with options of like maybe Game Pass or something in the future, obviously on the Xbox platform. What was your reasoning for focusing on Xbox? Like why not Why not Switch? Why not PlayStation? What What was your, your drive to go Xbox first? Well, I mean, I, I, my goal was with doing like 50 games in a year or 50 prototypes, I should say, because they're not they're not all full games. Some of them are just prototypes. Um, I guess they're all prototypes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, the idea was um, kind of going back to my visual artist roots. Um, any anybody who's trying to learn how to draw or paint, uh, you'll see that they have a sketchbook with them at all times. Um, that's because they want to be drawing all uh, any chance that they get. Um, and so that was kind of my idea with the prototype.
prototyping. That was kind of my sketchbook. Um, and you know that uh, anyone who draws knows that sketching has two purposes. Uh, one is to practice, and two, it's to work out um, details of, of like a bigger painting or a, a more serious work. Um, it's a place where you could experiment and and work out problems um, before you get to like your final draft, right? You got your sloppy copy, then you got your final draft. Um, so that was kind of my my plan with doing all of these. I was going to do a bunch of prototypes and then pick out the best ones and uh, see if I could uh, pitch them to a publisher or or a, a console or something. Um, um, so I. At this point, I met a few developers um, who had actually gotten their stuff onto console um, uh, here in Lexington. I had just moved over here to Lexington, and there was a, a meetup that they do on Tuesdays. And uh, I got to talk to people, and I was like, how do, you, how do you get your game onto console? And they basically walked me through the process, and they told me, you know, Xbox has this ID at Xbox program uh, that stands for independent developer at Xbox. And it's really easy to get in right now. Uh, PlayStation, um, they have their own program. It's a little bit, it's a little bit tougher, but it's still not too hard. And then uh, at the time, Nintendo Switch had just come out and um, so that one was probably the toughest to get into. It's probably not true anymore. It's like, that's probably the best place for indies. Um, so I took what I thought was my most popular game, uh, Unicrome, and uh, I just did it. I just pitched it to Xbox. I went to their website. I applied for um, their program. Um, uh, I had a um, art made up. I had uh, this minute-to-minute -minute, um, write-up of what the gameplay was going to be like. I had my elevator pitch on point. Um, so I, I pretty much I did my homework and I took everyone's advice of I, I researched on YouTube, you know, how do you get onto console? And I and I did those things and uh, sure enough, Xbox was like, okay, um, we're gonna send you some some developer kits. I've never owned an Xbox before in my life until they sent me uh, some developer kits and um, and uh, I signed a contract with them to to put the game out on Xbox. Um, I'm way overdue. Um, so I was supposed to have it out a long time ago. Um, so that's the reason why. Um, it's just because I, those were the first that I, that I went to, and um, they basically said, you know, we want, we want it to be an exclusive to Best Buy. Um, I would prefer to be on, uh, on all of the platforms. Obviously, Switch is great for indies um and then sony uh, i just got my ps5 um after like weeks of trying to get it um that controller that that, that playstation has you know the, not only the ps5 one but the ps4 one as well had so many unique features uh, i would love to develop for that right um but i want to i want to finish this game first um, before i go on to um, to design something for, for the other platform um, but that's the reason. There's, there's no. It wasn't like a thing where like I'm an Xbox fanboy and I just want it to be on Xbox. So uh, we made a deal, and uh, and that's that's it. That's the way it happened. Yeah, I mean that makes a lot of sense. Like you said, I've I've heard the same thing in the indie scene is that Xbox is one of the easier ones to get onto, and their developer kit is a little bit easier to work with than Sony's is, and so it's it's kind of to each their own. Um, and Switch, yes, yeah, which is just blowing up with indies right now. You see so many coming out on there and doing really well. Um, so you said you have a whole bunch of other projects that you've worked on. Are you working on any of those right now, or are you just focused on Unicrome? Um, well, well, here's the thing: that's uh, so I don't have like I don't have like a budget for Unicrome, right? So the reason that it's taken for me so long to finish it, it's not just it's not because it's such a complex game, and it's because you know I have to. I have to eat, you know. I have to live. So uh, a lot of uh, a lot of well, the challenge in making this game, well, what I would consider my first indie game, um, it, is is finding ways to uh, pay for it, right? Uh, uh, 
uh, still having to make a living off of that. So I do uh, some freelance work. I do some, some of the apps that I have on there. I was hired to make those um, those uh, mobile games. Um, I've also done some browser games for people. Um, I do a lot of uh, graphic work and a lot of like uh, drawings. Um, I teach as well. I do um, some animation classes. I do uh, some drawing classes, and those are those are full time jobs, right? Those, it's a uh, uh, part of being an artist. It's like um, you have to keep constantly looking for that next job, and um, and having to do that and come through uh, with these uh, with these contracts. Um, it, it takes a lot of time, so it, it, it's hard to also make a full video game on the side. Um, right now, I'm trying to focus just on your Chrome. Um, I've been trying to do that for, for three years, but the, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, um, um, I need to get it out there now at this point. Um, um, that's kind of where I'm at, where it's 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 been something that's kind of been weighing me down a little bit um, because it's in the back of my mind all the time. And it's just a matter of, of being able to just call it done and being able to move on to the next thing. Um, uh, there are uh, There is one game that's going to come out for mobile, again, that I got hired by a band, uh, Tropa Magica, that's going to come out. And it's also a platformer um, if you are into... Uh, Mexican psychedelic cumbia punk. Um, I have to say, definitely check that game out. Um, a lot of references to like um, uh, Mexican culture and uh, Mexican television. Um, a lot of great music. Um, and it's called Tropa Magica. It's it's not out yet, but uh, it's gonna be out here very very soon. So that's the other project that I'm working on. Awesome. I mean, it sounds great to me. It uh, definitely sounds like a fun, fun game. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess the last question I have for you here is going to fall in the development round, which you've, you've kind of mentioned. Um, what are, let's just stick with two. Let's go with your two biggest tips to aspiring indie developers as to how to avoid pitfalls or what direction to go or where to start with your development, things like that. Um, yeah, okay, so um, uh, the way that I started making games was um, with level editors, right? Uh, level Games that had level editors already built in. Um, so there are many, many tools out there to create video games. Um, but the problem with those is that they pretty much start with, like, with a blank slate. So it's like um, if you download Unity or something, um, it, it, there are there are many starter kits, yes, but pretty much you're just kind of thrown into the deep end right off the bat. And then there are other things like um, RPG Maker, which um, it already comes with pre-made graphics, tons of music, sound effects. Um, it already kind of has like a little level kind of already made for you. Um, the level editor, the map editor is really easy to use. The interface is really uh, user friendly. Um, so um, I would say start off with things that are easier to use. Don't don't go straight into, um, you know, trying to make your own engine right off of the bat. Um, um, and um, see where what your strengths are and try to play play to those. Um, the next thing I would say is um, uh, do some tutorials online. Um, there are plenty of tutorials um, that will walk you through step by step how to make any type of game. There's uh, tutorials on how to make RPGs. There's tutorials on how to make multiplayer games. Uh, there's tutorials on how to make platformers. Pretty much any game that you want to try to make, um, there's tutorials out there for you. Um, and then also, uh, seek out other people that that actually make games. Um, it it's going to be a lot easier to learn in that way. It's it's it, you can learn so much from tutorials and on your own, um, 
but you're going to learn so much more from someone who can just tell you, hey, you know, if you just click on that thing or if you just use this code instead of that one or, you know, if, the, if there's somebody there who can just teach you from experience, that's going to be um, way, way more helpful. Um, the other thing that I was going to say, uh, I totally lost my train of thought. I was going some other direction. Um, but those are definitely the, the ones that, the things that you should do. L look for an easy, uh, game engine to use, um, uh, and, and seek out help, uh, tutorials and people in person in real life. Um, and, and also, uh, one thing that you're going to learn, I think, um, is to iterate, um, Unlike other mediums, I think iteration is very important in video games. Um, so that means just like making and remaking and editing and going back, playing it. Does it feel good? Uh, does it not feel good? And really paying attention to that because I think a lot of people go into video games thinking that they're going to make a huge, sprawling MMORPG um, uh, the, their dream game um, but video games aren't made you don't they're not ideas that you make in your mind um, they're they're made on a computer and um, so what I mean by that is like uh, I've been teaching for a long time I've been teaching drawing since I was like 18 years old I think actually before that when I was 17 I think I got my first teaching job um, and what I always see with students is that there's one student in a drawing class that will refuse to draw or paint. He will go in there and he will have all of these great ideas and he'll want to describe them. He or she will want to describe them to me. And they'll be like, oh, I have this idea for a great painting. Um, there'll be the sun over here and there'll be a dragon coming out and they'll be facing and they'll be shooting fire. And I'll say, okay, we'll draw it. And they're like, well, oh, but I can't, I can't draw. Can, can you, can you draw it for me? And it's like, ideas are, are fine, um, but ultimately are not very useful, right? And, and I think people do the same thing when they're making video games. They have this idea fully formed in their mind. Oh, there's going to be three characters. Um, there's going to be uh, five different worlds and all of these different items. And they'll write them down in a notebook, and it'll all be very detailed. Um, but then when you start making it, maybe you're capable of making all of those things. Maybe you know how to create an inventory system. Maybe you already know how to uh, make a character select screen in all these different worlds. Um, but then you pick up the controller, and it's it's not fun, right? Um, this is This is a mistake I did very early on, where... I committed to ideas about games, and I sunk a lot of time into them, a lot of time and effort, and and it took me a, a long time to realize, hey, wait a minute, this great idea that I had, it's actually not fun, right? Um, so when you're making a game, listen to the game. The game knows what it needs to be fun. If you have this idea for uh, an MMORPG, but then when you start prototyping, hey, you know what? The fun thing is jumping and running. Maybe there should be a platformer. This whole inventory stuff, yeah, I thought it through, and uh, it's very detailed, and it's great. But if, if it's not fun, um, don't be afraid to scrap it. Don't be afraid to go in a different direction. Uh, and and be OK with listening to the game itself. Uh, alongside that, I would say, um, Make games that you enjoy making. <laughs> I know it sounds weird, but um, it's your job to make them. Um, and the only way you're going to have fun making them is if you make games that you enjoy making. Uh, that's different from games that you enjoy playing. Uh, I, I like playing RPGs. I like playing story-heavy games. Um, uh, I just played Detroit uh, Become Human on PlayStation. Uh, that game was so much fun for me to play. Um, I would not have fun making a game like that. Uh, I've tried. I've tried to make RPGs. I've tried to make certain types of games that I like to play, but I don't like making them. I don't like 
creating systems like that. I don't like creating uh, hyper-realistic kind of scenarios. Um, I like making arcade games, um, even though that's not always what I like to play. I'm not saying that that's, I don't like arcade games at all, but um, it's not my favorite thing. It's not my go-to thing. Um, I don't play Final Fantasy VII Remake, um, but I don't think I would enjoy making Final Fantasy VII Remake. In fact, that would probably be a nightmare. Um, so try to look, try to make a game that you like to make, not the game that you like to play. And don't make the game that's in your mind. Um, make the game that's in front of you, right? Um, uh, so that's that's a those are big lessons that I've learned um, to just try to listen to the game itself and try to pay attention to what it is that you're doing. Um, through that type of point of view, through that lens. Um, yeah. yeah, I heard a ton of really good advice in there. I mean, it's it's make a game you enjoy making, not necessarily what you like playing, because that's what so many people do is they're like, I love this game. I want to make a game like this, but it's way more than they expect. So they're biting off more they can, than they can chew. Got to be adaptable. Be ready to pivot. Don't get stuck in one idea. You can always go a different direction with it, and it, it might be better. And I mean, you're right. You got to listen to the game. If the game is boring, then you got to figure out how to make it fun. Like, why why keep wasting time on that game that's boring when you could just you know, start over or pivot? Um, I guess to wrap yeah, everything up with you, Rafa, is just give us your social medias. Let us know where people can find you, check out your games, and follow you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Super 8 Bit Rafa, um, Super, the number 8 B I T uh rafa right there um right there right there um so that's me on twitter that's me on instagram um if you want to check out information about the game um or the project that i'm working on uh my publishing company we have to you have to make a publishing company when you go to consoles um it's the street level hero.com um so you, you'll find um some press kits on there and you'll you'll see stuff that i'm working on right there uh some contact information uh as well as um this website doesn't exist yet but by the time this airs it will exist and that's uh unichromegame.com um if you want to know more about unichrome and how you can help support me make this um, um i'm not asking for any money right now i'm just asking for sort of like uh this um like uh not emotional support but just like send me the, your good vibes um uh, so unichromegame.com uh follow me on social media twitter and instagram uh i'd love to hear what you have to think uh what you have to say about the game um it will be coming out soon and i will have a more definitive date uh for you guys uh, about what that is um, so unichrome i don't think i even said what it is it's a it's a it's a black and white a pixel art uh, shoot 'em up bullet hell platformer about a unicorn with a shotgun uh, trying to bring back color to this world, um, and it's fully voiced. Um, it has sort of like a '90s cartoon kind of story to it. Um, it's it's funny as hell, and um, you should all check it out and, and and buy twelve of them when it does come out. Awesome. I'm going to throw all those links down in the description so you guys can check it out. Um, and yeah, I mean, such a good idea for a game. You got to bring back the color in such a fun, exciting. I, I love bullet storm kind of games where it's just like a mess. Like I said, it, it reminds me so much of Enter the Gungeon, and I absolutely love that game. Um, but that wraps everything up for us here. Thanks for coming on, Rafa. Um, if you guys like what we're doing, if you like what we're doing here at Indie Arcade Wave, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, whether you're on the podcast or the YouTube channel. Check out our other social medias, and our Patreon is up as well. Uh, we got the new flag. Uh, we haven't decided if we're selling it yet or not, but we will have merch coming in the future. So check that out. And until next time, peace.